Walking down the street, we are surrounded by the beauty of the modern city. Occasionally, a corner of an ancient building may stir our heart. Half hidden, half visible, amidst the fog, these ancient buildings stand quietly. Facing them, I wonder where the inspiration of aesthetic feeling for Chinese architecture has come from. Let's start this story from home. Even long-term residents here may have forgotten that the gate clasps over the gates used to symbolize the position and status of this family. Those were the old rules and regulations hundreds of years ago. Common families were only allowed two gate clasps over their gates. Officials' families could have four gate clasps. This was an imperial family's gate. The total number of rooms starting with the entrance the gate's color, the number of nails in the gate, the stone to tether horses at the doorway, the stone lions outside the gate, and on and on, right from the entrance, every door of every house demonstrates the proprieties and customs of Chinese architecture. After entering this Sihuyuan quadrangle compound in Beijing, thinking about those older people who passed in and out of the principal rooms hundreds of years ago, the location of the principal rooms, and the overall arrangement of the courtyard, all this embodies the stateliness of the homeowner. Here, one by one, courtyards are orderly and precisely arranged in a series along the same axis. Children live and play in the side rooms. Customarily, girls of wealthy families were not allowed to go in and out of the courtyards as openly as men were. Here, the symmetrical layout, the blocked-out atmosphere created by the courtyard, and the etiquette and ethics indicated by countless details demonstrate a kind of strict order. The family hierarchy is thus regulated in Chinese residential buildings through their arrangement. These are the residential buildings in the city. A man with his four wives lives in this large old-style mansion with six courtyards, where the man's stateliness and power penetrated every stone and brick of the walls. This scene is from the famous movie Raise the Red Lantern. Although the true story that took place in this mansion was not as bewildering as the one in the film, its corridors, screen walls, 
door sills, flower engravings, and every detail of the construction reveal the lifestyle particular to well-off families in the North. Walking along the long corridor, we are amazed by the stateliness of the building. The Chao family's living quarters is located on the north central plains of China. It occupies an area of over 10,000 square meters and has six big courtyards, 20 small courtyards, and 313 rooms. Geometric relations can be found in every part of it. The whole mansion is like a castle surrounded by a full-blocked brick wall 10 meters high. For security and to avoid misfortune from outside, the closed high wall demonstrates the most common concept behind Chinese residential architecture, that is, defense, self-restraint, and strict rule. The corridor is a connecting axis along which the six courtyards are divided. On the left live senior members of the family and on the right, the lower ranking members. So, houses in northern courtyards on the left are apparently higher in rank than those in southern courtyards. Also, northern courtyards occupy a larger area than southern courtyards. Those of senior rank live in the northern courtyards and those of lower rank live in the southern courtyards. The layout of houses were thus planned, so the order of those of senior and lower ranks is naturally arranged. Those of different ranks enter through different doors and eat in different levels of dining rooms. The high door sill symbolizes the belief that the rich family brings up high officials and keeps all wealth for themselves. Be sure not to step on the door sills, you should step over them. It is said that if you step on the door sills, you will lose money. Walking along the corridor until you reach the end of it, there is an ancestral temple of a wealthy family. It is used not only as a place to worship ancestors, but also a place to solve family disputes and to punish family members who do wrong. It is similar to a small government office in feudal China. In the sense of architecture, it also dominates everything and is very stately. It combines the function of use together with the spiritual significance of ceremonies and proprieties. In the central plains where the Chow family's living quarters is located, there are many large magnificent residential houses representing architectural myths accumulated over the ages. The stories of these residential courtyards realize the ultimate dreams of China's agricultural era. It inspires us to conform to nature and embodies the paramount importance of order. Why are most of the tiny stone carvings on the roofs aquatic animals? What kind of fantastic stories can there be in the complicated carvings under the roof girders and eaves? Close to Chinese architecture, among the storied building and rubble, 
we find a breath of the natural and the beauty of art flowing. These beautiful and bright engraved details are not dimmed by the spectacle, grandness, and rules of the strata of the buildings. These carvings are the work of craftsmen and architectural artisans. The carved beams and lacquered pillars meet the eye. The homeowner's purpose of creating luxurious architectural embellishments was not to seek beauty. Usually, these decorations were needed to demonstrate their wealth, to wish for good luck, or to evade fire disasters. Their strong wishes are carved in the stone and wood by craftsmen and appear as the stone and wood carvings. Like the laces of the dress worn by European aristocrats in the Middle Ages, usually heavy, complicated, and time-consuming craftwork exaggerates wealth. Those who could afford to build the flower-hung doors invited artisans. The artisans had different patterns in mind. Colorful flowers with green leaves in full bloom decorate the flower-hung doors, extremely gorgeous. South of the Yangtze River, wood carvings are quite expressive. They are dedicated to match the beautiful landscape south of the Yangtze River. They imitate nature and borrow from landscapes to express emotion. From these complicated carvings, it seems we can sense the leisurely breath of the artisans. The carvings of the water-based regions of East China, in their symmetry, bring out the mechanism of nature. Stone carving inside courtyards in Shanxi province are full of metaphors of satisfaction. Every brick and stone here has its story of happiness, longevity, and wealth. Grapes symbolize more children. Bamboo is the sign of a literary family. Bats symbolize hopes for happiness. Peony and vases symbolize wealth and best wishes and peace and safety in the four seasons. Architecture in the north is stable and massive, serving as a contrast the delicate craftwork enhances the rhythm of the structure. The complicated carved beams and lacquered pillars carry the workmanship of the craftsmen and the imagination of beauty of the Chinese people. They are in harmony with nature.
different visages are shown in the construction of the imperial residence. In March 1521 AD, on his way to the imperial palace to ascend the throne, Emperor Zhu Houzong stopped suddenly upon discovering he was to enter the palace through the East Flower Gate. East Flower Gate looks no different from any other gate of the palace, but those who understand the imperial rules know there is one less row of nails on this gate than on any other gate in the palace. According to practice, there should be nine lines of nails with nine nails in each line on the gates of the imperial palace. Nine by nine is 81, but the East Flower Gate has only eight lines of nails. The number of lines of nails represents the different ranks. Although Emperor Zhu Houzong did not come from an imperial family, he knew that with one less line of nails, the East Flower Gate ranked lower than the West Flower Gate, the Meridian Gate, or the Gate of Divine Prowess. On arriving at the gate, the future emperor refused to enter. The empress, trying to show her authority, compromised. On noon, April 28, 1521, Zhu Houzong, as he wished, entered the palace through the central road under the Gate of Great Brightness to succeed the throne and become emperor. Each gate holds many royal secrets. This is a magnified home. In this magnificent structure, the strict social strata system reached its peak. Each gate, corridor, hall, and step is full of restrictions and metaphors. In this city within a city, even a minor act of indiscretion could cost one his or her life. The Forbidden City of Beijing is the largest and most perfectly preserved body of ancient imperial palace architecture, representing the height of ancient Chinese architecture. For the past 500 years, the Forbidden City has been the center of both the Chinese ruling class and Chinese politics and culture. Here, 24 emperors spent their imperial careers in succession, whether that be short or long, glorious or bleak. The backbone of this complicated cluster of buildings is an 8,000-meter-long axis called the Dragon Pulse. All major clusters of buildings are arranged based on this axis as a reference. The Chinese people with a long history believe that it is unnecessary to excessively pursue size and extravagance. As long as the clusters are well organized, a lofty realm can be reached naturally. So, the construction of this imperial palace emphasizes not its height but being laid out on a plane to establish a system that symbolizes heaven and earth as one, a tranquil paradise, an earthly heaven with unparalleled serenity.
Pursuing the philosophy of man and God in perfect harmony is both the cultural spirit of Chinese tradition and the method of Chinese architectural layout. The point of view of the design is usually order in a space to reflect the corroboration of everything in nature within the layout and not only to consider the visual sense on the ground. The integrated proprieties inspired and established naturally are embodied not only in these clusters of buildings, but in the details of the construction as well. Flying eaves, four-footed beasts, different styles of roofs. Turrets, glazed tiles, vermeil pillars in halls. Ornamental pillars, lions, golden dragons decorated in the Hushi style. Doors and windows, plaques, handrails, sundials, and imperial paths. Walls, arch openings, stone carvings, and the Guild Bronze Pavilion outside the Palace of Heavenly Purity. Countless architectural details sketch the palaces, just like slowly spreading painted scrolls or a chessboard in picturesque disarray with viewpoints from the air as well as from the ground. There is an old saying in China, without a compass and ruler, you cannot draw a proper square or circle. The layout of the imperial palace represents the rules in squares and circles, and the proprieties are shown in the details of the architecture. Thus, order is concrete here. Will the rules and proprieties be as eternal as the star mansion? days and nights, and everything in nature? There are some earlier imperial palaces, but all we can see here are incomplete pedestals. This is a site of remains in Henan province in North China, which can be traced back 3,300 years. The largest pedestal that remains is over 80 meters long and about 14 meters wide. They are all built of rammed earth about one meter above the ground. They must have been either the residence of an imperial palace or a temple for sacrifice. It is exactly these difficult to identify sites that lure us into thoughts of distant Chinese architectural history. Thank you.
the city is like a big home without a roof. It is said that there used to be a manor granted by an emperor here 4,000 years ago. The ancient city of Pingyao originally had city walls made of rammed earth, the construction of which started in the Western Zhou Dynasty before 700 BC. In the 14th century AD, based on the need for military defense, the Ming Dynasty rebuilt the walls on the basis of the old original city walls using the bricks and stones we see today. So far, the city walls, streets, homes, stores, and temples in this city are basically well preserved. There has been almost no change in their architectural structure, style, and features. Most of the architectural treasures in both the downtown and suburban areas have been preserved. They all belong to an existing organic part of the historic cultural relic of Pingyao and are a living specimen of the history of Chinese politics, economy, culture, military, architecture, art, and other facets. A domestic courtyard is a small home. An imperial palace in the national capital is a home of stateliness and propriety. Even bigger homesteads are cities whose architecture is connected to the lifestyles of its people. The ancient Great Wall, as the defense of the city, used to protect a bigger home. In construction of both small and large homes, we see the most cordial veneration for heaven and earth and the most solid guardianship of the people themselves.